You can do basically any exercise using one of two fundamental mechanical styles. And depending on which one you use, the emphasis of your training and the gains you get from it can change dramatically. An easy way to grasp this concept is to think of it sort of like handedness or chirality. The concept that two things can seem basically identical, but actually be non-superimposable mirror images of each other. The effect of chirality in chemistry makes a great simile for its effects in exercise. Because one molecule might be completely benign, but have a mirror image that is extremely toxic. Despite both of them being made of literally the exact same components, the same atoms. Although they may look the same, they don't always behave the same. The right-handed isomer of the drug thalidomide is a perfectly fine, good medicine to give to a pregnant woman to prevent morning sickness, but make the mistake of giving that same pregnant woman the left-handed isomer of the drug thalidomide, and her child will be born with horrible birth defects. Very similarly, you can see that there's a kind of handedness in the way you can execute the mechanics of any exercise, with each of these two styles of execution being very different and distinct lifts with different and distinct training effects, despite looking nearly identical and having the same components, like a similar stance position, grip width, or bar position. And while I understand this take sounds kinda schizo, it shouldn't actually be all that weird if you think about it. Because everyone already sort of accepts in the cultural zeitgeist of fitness that there is two sorts of ways of doing every lift. What the hell are you talking about? Through variations, like the close grip bench or the normal grip bench, the low bar squat or the high bar squat, the conventional deadlift or being... Jay! Most of what these variations aim to do is sort of fuck with leverage in a way that encourages you to use a different mechanical style than the one you normally use. But manipulating your positioning on lifts in this way to indirectly affect mechanics without actually realizing that you're trying to affect mechanics is kind of retarded because it leads many, if not most people, to try to solve mechanics problems by altering their positioning, which very often does not actually result in the mechanical changes that they were sort of unconsciously hoping to achieve. If you combine this with the fact that most people will default into doing whatever style they're strongest at and find most comfortable in a given lift, that's right, it's the square hole. You end up with a bunch of people in ruts with huge muscle imbalances that they don't realize that they have. You been lifting weight? Uh, no. Because they've been so locked into one way of doing a row or a bench press or whatever. And I think this is the essential problem that underlies most people's stubborn issues that come up in training. Like lagging parts of their physique that they can't seem to bring up, plateaus they can't seem to break through, or injuries they can't seem to rehab. If a chemist produced the wrong chirality of a drug, it might not have a therapeutic effect on a patient. Because it's a fundamentally different substance and not the one that's required for the job. I think it's because he drank a green potion from a stranger. I don't think it's because of the potion I drank. I think it's just because of allergies. And in the same way, if you use the wrong chirality of a lift, it might not have the effect on your body that you would expect it to. That's how people end up in positions where no amount of benching is able to bring up their lagging chest because they're using the mechanics that deprioritize pec involvement. And seemingly, no amount of split squats are rehabbing their knee pain because they're using the chirality that doesn't target the structures relevant to their injury. <laughs> you know what the problem is? You got it set to M for mini, when it should be set to W for Wumbo. These sorts of problems are the reason I'm making this video. And my goal is to explain and demonstrate what these mechanics are and how they work so that you can recognize them and manipulate them consciously to pull yourself out of these ruts and unknot the stubborn problems you might encounter in your training. The way I'll structure this video is that I'll first go through some of the prerequisite concepts you'll need to understand these two broad mechanical styles of exercises that I'm going to cover. And then I'll go through and show on a case-by-case -case basis how they're practically applied to every major compound movement. Let's get into it. First important prerequisite concept is that you're a rotational creature. Basically every kind of movement that can be performed has some kind of rotational component or movement occurring at the shoulders or at the hips. And there's two directions for these rotations either internally 
or externally. And it's important to note that these rotations can be generated or you know biased by manipulating the hands and the feet. Where pressuring weight towards the thumb or the big toe generally causes internal rotation as a limb moves. While twisting or applying weight towards the pinky toe or the pinky generally causes external rotation. The next conceptual layer is that your limbs prefer to rotate together when performing a bilateral movement, like most compound exercises. That means if your shoulders are externally rotating, it's very difficult and awkward to powerfully move in an internal rotation of your femurs, and vice versa. With a poor stance, you are unbalanced and you can be easily knocked over. So if your shoulders are externally rotating during the drive of a movement, odds are your hips are biased that way too. Much better. It's also important to note that these rotations are intimately connected to the neck and sternum and that movements in them can affect and actually drive rotations in the limbs. With extension of the neck and sternum being linked to external rotation of the limbs and flexion of the neck and sternum being linked to internal rotation of the limbs. These last couple patterns added together create a binary and that binary are these two fundamental mechanical patterns that I discussed at the beginning of this video. One where the limbs internally rotate alongside neck and sternum flexion, which I call a flexion kip or a flexion pattern, and one where all the limbs externally rotate alongside neck and sternum extension, something I call an extension kip or an extension pattern. An important note here is that regardless of what kind of pattern you're using, to truly get a feel for and accentuate this connection between the neck and sternum and into the limbs, it's very important that you're holding proper oral posture or mewing. Connecting the neck, sternum, and limbs in this way was the topic of my last video, which I recommend if these ideas sound unfamiliar. Moving forward, let's look at the flexion kip first. In the flexion kip, as you load up the eccentric of a movement, the limbs externally rotate, the neck extends, and the sternum extends. And alongside this, there's a general arching of the lower back, with a sense that this notch at your sternum is getting kind of stretched and loaded like a spring. And that the extension I've been discussing is occurring because the point opposite your sternum is sort of driving into it through your back. Then during a concentric, this expanded extended position is reversed by driving this point of the sternum into the back and towards neutrality alongside flexion of the neck and lower back, also to a more neutral position. And these movements combine to create a sort of power stroke where the act of them flexing drives the limbs through whatever motion is demanded of them while internally rotating them. The inverse mechanical pattern is an extension kip or an extension pattern, where the movement is loaded by having yourself be in a neck flexed position, a sternum flexed position, and a lower back flexed position, with the limbs in internal rotation. And all of these movements are achieved by driving that point on your sternum into its opposite point on your back that we just covered. Then to apply the concentric, this is reversed and the point on your back is driven towards your sternum in a way that expands and extends your whole body and drives the limbs while externally rotating them. I highly suggest you stop here and actually try miming these movements as I've been demonstrating them and seeing the interconnectedness of these movements for yourself. Then once you do, we can start expanding this concept into every other plane of movement and type of lift. However, before we can get into proper lifting, there is still a couple things I need to mention. Oh, we were right there! First off, these mechanics aren't always represented in actual lifting in this extreme of a form, but I think wherever they are applicable to be leaned into, doing so makes for better execution of a lift. It's also very important to know that most people tend to get fixated on one style of mechanical execution or another on a given exercise. And as we move on to the next section, I think your primary goal should be to figure out what your most used execution style is for each lift and how to execute the opposite mechanical style. Because bringing up and targeting that weaker mechanical style is likely to solve almost all of your problems in training by allowing you to fix muscle imbalances that are probably leading to a bunch of aches and pains as well as capping your strength and size potential. And with that said, let's get into it. Let's start with the squat. What most people think of as a low bar squat is what I would consider to be mechanically an extension kip squat. And this is an excellent example of the problem I mentioned earlier of confusing and conflating mechanics and positioning. Because I think the majority of people perform all of their squatting, regardless of bar position, 
as an extension kip, or you could also think of it as with low bar mechanics, where there's a slight rounding of the sternum, neck, and lower back, and an internal rotation of the limbs during the descent which all then reverse during the concentric into an expanded, externally rotated position. By my understanding, that makes the rounding of the lower back that most people think of as butt wink a normal and natural occurrence of this style of squat. Because as you'll see in the following examples, most extension kips involve some kind of motion from a neutral or slightly rounded lower back into an arched one over the course of the concentric, which is exactly what we see here. In my experience, this lift seems to mainly use outer quad as its primary knee extensor and develop it and the glute maximus as its primary hip extensor and that last part makes a lot of sense because the power stroke of the lift is moving into external rotation and the glute maximus is an external rotator of the hip now let's take a look at the flexion kip squat which is the inverse pattern this is what I would consider high bar mechanics. And in order to achieve the bottom position, you expand your body as you descend and externally rotate your femurs and shoulders. That includes making a lower back arch, which is the inversion of the slight lower back rounding you see in the extension kip squat. Then during the ascension, these are reversed and there's a sense of that sternum spring collapsing back. Properly descending into the bottom position by externally rotating your femurs is actually hard enough to do that it merits its own tutorial and so i made one previously so if you're curious about how to flexion squat i highly suggest you check out that video the primary knee extensor of this lift seems to be the inner quad or vmo and the primary hip extensor used in it seems to be the adductor magnus which again sort of makes sense because it's an internal rotator of the hip and the power stroke of this lift is internal rotation. I also find that it hits the glute medius or side ass pretty well, and I'm suspicious that's in order to prevent your legs from caving in as you move through internal rotation. Like I said before, it's very important that you figure out what style you squat in and get good at the inverse style. For most people, that's going to be a flexion kip style of squatting, and developing it will probably help you dramatically rehab and bulletproof your hips and knees. And to clear up some confusion about bar position, I think for most people, it's more intuitive to use an extension style of lifting the lower the bar gets on your back, and vice versa, a flexion style the higher the bar gets on your back. But ultimately, both styles are probably equally viable in either bar position, with a lower bar position potentially allowing you to get more hip engagement, the higher bar position encouraging more knee bending, with all their actual emphasis other than that being decided by mechanical style. The next lift we're going to look at is the deadlift. I think the wider your stance gets, the more people tend to favor using a flexion style of lift at the elite level. And the narrower the stance gets, the more people seem to favor an extension style of lift, with both probably being equally viable in both positions, with a wider stance being more leg dominant and a narrower one being more hip dominant. With that being said, most people I see in commercial gyms seem to massively favor a flexion style of deadlift regardless of what variant they're actually using, where the bottom position is relatively expanded and externally rotated, and the concentric is one of flexion and internal rotation of all the limbs. This can often cause a rounded pulling position as someone rises out of a conventional deadlift. But I think just like Buttwink, this is a natural result of using this style of mechanics, and not something to necessarily be worried about. A lot of the lower body emphasis of a flexion deadlift is very similar to a flexion squat, that the adductor magnus and side ass seem to be prioritized over the glutes as hip extensors. Additionally, it also seems to prioritize more lat engagements and less upper back. By feel, this style of pulling also seems to hit my erectors differently from an extension style of pull, but I couldn't tell you anything about what's going on there anatomically. Now, here's an example of the extension deadlift, where the bottom position is one of hip and shoulder internal rotation. There's a general extension and external rotation through the concentric. This internally rotated starting position seems to massively increase hamstring activation to the point where just miming the motion can give you a menacing hamstring contraction. It also, like I said before, seems to hit the glute max harder as well as the upper back. Like the squat, it's very important to make sure you're well developed in both styles of pulling in order to keep your lower body bulletproof and make many of your deadlifting related problems melt away. Now let's take a look at benching. 
lift with an extension style, which is what most elite lifters seem to favor when they perform a close grip bench. But again, it's probably viable regardless of grip positioning, with closer grip just shifting emphasis towards the arms and a wider grip shifting emphasis into the torso. As you can see, there's a rounding as the press is set up alongside internal rotation and then an unrounding and external rotation over the course of the press. The weird part of this list for a lot of people is the leg drive mechanics and I think it's best to think of them with the same sort of style as the relevant squat pattern. So in this case, the extension squat. To set up the arch in the bottom position, the hips hyperextend more than the lower back hyperextends, with actual lower back extension coming in as the concentric goes through during the leg drive. Very similar to the natural sort of arching that happens as you come out of an extension squat. This style of press seems to favor the long head of the tricep as its primary elbow extensor and the upper pec and shoulders as primary shoulder flexors. The inverse is the flexion style bench whose lower body mechanics mimic those of the flexion squat with the bottom position being more of a lower back arch than a hip hyperextension that then switches into a more flexed lower back position just like the squat. The power stroke is also one where the body generally flexes and internally rotates and this leads to preferentially using the lateral head of the tricep and the pectoralis major. Getting good in both styles can help you avoid shoulder injuries and probably more so than anything else we've covered can really impact the shape generally of your physique. If you can't seem to grow your pecs from benching, you're probably performing the extension style. And if your arm size doesn't seem to be improved by benching, there's a good chance you're only doing the flexion style and missing out on a bunch of long head development. And we march onwards into the row. You should hopefully see the general patterns by now, so I'm going to blast through these. Most people only flexion row, which is a lat dominant way of rowing, which makes sense because the lats are internal rotators. And just by feel, I get a sense that these hit my brachialis more than my biceps. And then here's the extension style row, which hits some upper back muscles seemingly that are not the lats more than the actual lats themselves. And I think hit my biceps harder than my brachialis. I've known many, many people to be able to rehab chronic shoulder problems by just learning the extension style row because it's so terribly neglected. But you know, same old deal, train both, be healthy, enough said. Pull-ups are basically more of the same, with the only major thing of note here being that in an extension pull-up, like what you're seeing here, a dead hang starts with your head sort of forward into a kind of pec stretch. And to kip the lift, you sort of drive your weight into an arch with your legs bending back behind you. Whereas in a flexion style pull, the dead hang has your head sort of back behind you in a way that allows you to extend your shoulders into a much deeper lat stretch. And the lift is kipped by sort of throwing the weight of your legs forward closer to like a crunch. This kind of goes without saying, but uh, you know, I'm a dumb ogre and the back's kind of complicated. But while these variations feel very different and seem to train very different muscle groups, I couldn't tell you what all the minute details of the differences are between them other than just, you know, lumping them all into lat or general upper back. Finally, let's take a look at the overhead press. I think the standard military press seems to most often be performed as a flexion style movement by elite lifters. And I think a large part of this is because the bottom of a flexion kip has the head and neck and sternum back behind you and out of the way of the bar path. This seems to prioritize the front delts and lateral head of the tricep. And just like the bench, the leg drive mechanics are very similar to a flexion style squat, where the lower back starts pretty arched and goes more towards neutrality during the press. By comparison, the behind the neck press seems to massively favor extension mechanics. To the degree that if you ever had like difficulty behind the neck pressing and you chalked it up to you know, bad mobility or the lift just being impossible, there's a very good chance that all those concerns would fade away if you tried performing it as an extension kip. And I say that as someone who's coached many immobile ogres through doing that exact same thing with great success. This style of pressing seems to largely favor the tricep long head as an elbow extensor and seems to favor the lateral head of the deltoid over the anterior head. I also get a ton of upper back engagement while doing this, 
uh, in the same vein as something like a y -rays. Now that we've covered every major plane of motion, I'd just like to really drive home how you can incorporate this information into your own training. First, by seeing these patterns clearly, you should be able to make much better decisions and easier decisions about exercise selection and programming, because you'll be much better at avoiding redundancy in the mechanics and focusing on mechanical styles that train relevant weaknesses to your problems. You should also be able to passively bulletproof and injury-proof your body much more easily, because if you're diligent about training every mechanical style in every relevant plane of motion, you should be able to minimize any huge imbalances or weaknesses that would leave you predisposed to injuries, because you'd essentially be just expanding Muse Over Toes Guy's principle of reversing out pain. This concept of reversing out knee pain probably has the most knee success story ever. By adding in the dimension of also inverting out pain and injuries. If you appreciate my eccentric approach to fitness problems, please like, subscribe, and comment so that my content can overtake the genetic determinist sarm goblins in the algorithm. Also, I'm offering anyone subscribed to this channel a free 40-minute consultation call through my Instagram. And if you're interested, shoot me a DM at Darwinian underscore fitness. Ideally, the way this would work is that you'd take me into the gym with you on a video call by using Bluetooth earbuds as you train. From there, I can almost certainly help you optimize whatever mechanics you want on a given lift to probably hit an immediate PR, or help you troubleshoot some kind of injury you have and help you devise a plan to rehab it on your own time. You could also obviously just pick my brain about a topic at home. I just think those two are probably the most bang for your buck. I'm doing this both in the hopes of fostering a tighter community around this channel and as a sort of free trial to anyone who might be interested in hiring me as a coach. And I hope this is a sustainable offer because I'm a tiny channel. Our prices, I hope, aren't too low! Thanks for watching, guys, and happy lifting.